The purpose of human incarnation and the plan behind life has been known to all the great religions of the world. It was known to the Gnostics and the early Christians, but lost during the darkness of the Middle Ages. That is the spiritual evolution of mankind through repeated experience in physical bodies, reincarnation, the law of cause and effect, or of retribution and reward, and the ultimate glory of liberation from rebirth have been the basic teachings throughout all the ages in both the East and West. Although different approaches to this truth have been employed based upon the time and place in which they have emerged. In every religion, the path to union with the Most High has been marked out. Sometimes it is called the second birth or the initiation. Buddha called it the path to nirvana, and Christ called it the straight and narrow gate, whereas Lao Tzu called it the way. All agree upon the same premise, the conquest of the desires by the little self and the downpouring of the divine spirit into the purified chalice of the heart. In Christian terms, it has sometimes been called the quest for the Holy Grail. Throughout time, there have been many who have gone ahead, who have attained these higher states of consciousness, and therefore transcended the world of becoming, and entered into the world of being. They mark out the path and guide their disciples on the perilous ascent to the heights of divine consciousness. They are the true saints and sages of the world and are known by many as the adepts or the masters of the wisdom, sometimes referred to as our elder brothers. They work on the inner side of life as their purpose is to lead all aspiring seekers of truth toward the golden gates of divine glory. Beforehand, we must live the virtuous life and yearn for spiritual freedom in order to invoke the divine spirit within us. One must also expand their consciousness and perceive a broader perspective of time in order to grasp the true scope of the spiritual path. The soul's journey through the human kingdom spans eons of time, and the births and deaths pass like days and nights. Yet it is the soul which remains and carries forward the continuity of consciousness between lives within its causal body. The spiritual marriage comes from uniting the lower seeds of consciousness with the rays of light from the spiritual sun, thus the blossoming of the soul through its full expression of divine fragrance. Within the circle of the heart lie great potent forces which may be called forth with knowledge. These forces, if used properly, can summon the dormant powers of the soul while provoking the creative magical work. Do not seek to hurry nor to delay, but proceed with assurance and with deliberation while having faith in the powers of light whom we represent. The first step in all things is the purification of the heart from all idle desires, idle emotions, from fear, despair, hatred, and doubt. These are foes to peace. Let them cease. 
The heart must become a shrine upon which an altar is built. Upon each morning, the self is sacrificed and made holy. Remember, the mind must be held steady between the eternal light and the shrine. As the shrine becomes real, as it ever breathes forth the incense of adoration to the Most High, it will begin to transmit the eternal light to the sacrificial self and to the world. The high point of any life comes after the personal karma for that life is over. This is the beginning of the impersonal life. Often there comes a sense of isolation and solitariness which the personal self must learn to embrace. Yet this later period of life is the true purpose of incarnation, not the family life, which is only a duty to the race. This latter period is that for which all the training of early years was planned. The years of youth and of early maturity correspond to the earlier stages of evolution, before the soul can manifest in the vehicles on behalf of the monad, or divine self. Strive ever consciously, joyously, with adoration to create a sacred chalice where the Lord of life may lift us above the fray so we can soar into the holy heights of divine consciousness. Indeed, the kingdom of God is within. Christ wished to avoid the worship of an exterior God and teach mankind the presence of God imminent. As St. Paul said, Christ must be born in you. All things come at their appointed time. That complete surrender to love, which is the most beautiful part of earthly love, accompanies the soul which has surrendered to God, feeds it with celestial food that never sates, encompasses it with divine love, protects it in all its comings and goings, so that our being reflects the radiance of eternal life, the beauty of the celestial spheres. Only when the heart cannot rise into the glory of the presence can doubt and darkness hinder the vision of the path. Zeal is required to ignite the flames of divine glory if they burn with love and wisdom. Control the serpent and become wise as a dragon. It is not enough to act. One must act wisely. Study the heart and act accordingly to kindness, and see your brothers and sisters for who they truly are. For the altar of the heart is the eternal sanctuary in all ages. Withdraw into its peace with all its serenity and let the worlds crumble if they must. If you can attain this, death is easy and the consciousness does not run wild like a frightened stallion. Teach others how to meet death with curiosity, without fear. It is the time when steadiness is most needed, lest you carry with you a turmoil of emotion that creates a similar turmoil in the inner worlds. Then a soul becomes lost in its own creations and as in a bad dream, much time may elapse before it can find itself again. To die quietly is a great virtue, and not only conductive to easy transition, but permits one to pass through the lower spheres directly to peace. 
Only as one learns to see the archetypes of the inner planes can one truly begin to see the plan behind life. Often our work to which we give our lives is but an experimental sketch, part of which may or may not be later used in the final building. It is akin to scenes played out, but later cut from a finished film. So try to see all things here, not as success or failure, but as the architect's tentative drawings, which shall guide the future final plan. We learn many things throughout reincarnation. After all, life is but a training school. The outposts of consciousness reach far into the past and future. One who is trained may visit them occasionally, but do not stray too long. For the present must be ever vivid, ever real. So one can enter into the eternal unity of life undivided by eras of time. To escape time is one of the purposes of occult truth and humanity is fast approaching that great event which will bring about the annihilation of time as we know it. The strands of life are woven by both pain and joy, of success and defeat, of hunger and fulfillment. We are leaving the darker strands behind as the newer, lighter qualities must be woven in May peace be found in the chalice of the heart. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations, before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. A thousand years in your eyes are like a day that has just gone by. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow for they quickly pass and we fly away. Teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Fill us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants and your splendor shown to their children. And let the beauty of the Lord rest upon us and establish the work of our hands for us. Firstly, it is important to note that a disciple here is one who follows the guidance of their own soul, or is at least more or less in tune with its intention to some degree. Remember, the great evolutionary process deals with the spiritual development of individuals, not with their personal happiness nor their personal desires. Consider the Buddha and the decision which he had to make to sacrifice the immediate happiness of his family in order to help humanity, which they were a part. In helping humanity, he helped them too. Yet the immediate decision 
brought about great suffering. No one can attain the heights of wisdom who dares not view the present from the impersonal perspective of the hierarchy. There is an immeasurable difference between the affection and emotional devotion of a human and the impersonal wisdom of the master. To attain this, the very roots of being must be torn loose, for the maternal and parental instinct, which is injected into the very atoms long before one reaches the human kingdom, must be diverted from the personal to the impersonal, from the love of offspring and family to the service of mankind. It is perhaps a seeming destruction of something very beautiful and precious, yet one cannot tread further along the path while one is bound by personal affection. Remember the symbolic words of Christ which are the words spoken to all would-be initiates. He that loveth mother or son more than me is not worthy of me. There will be test after test on these lines until every tendril of the personal life personal affection has been torn loose, so that the whole nature may reach upward to the divine self and ally completely with its intention and with its grandiose purposes. The task of the disciple is to balance and round out his or her nature. Often for some years, or even lives, we are required to meet conditions not to our liking foreign to our peculiar line of work in order to develop qualities which are still lacking. The purpose of a teacher is not only to attune the student to a higher level of vibration, but also to give dispassionate counsel as to their own nature, which they cannot view correctly from within the limitations of their own ego. Until the causal body is partially shattered, the mind is enclosed within it, as within an egg. It stores up the experiences of its earthly lives and develops there a certain amount of instinct and intuition as to what dangers to avoid. It also develops a conscience that discerns right from wrong. But it cannot escape from the self-consciousness which had to be developed and protected by the causal body in the earlier periods of evolution in preparation for entering universal consciousness, until the man emerges a more or less finished product, as a chicken does from its egg. The growth is not complete until mastery over the worldly forces is achieved. But with the first initiation, man begins his life as a conscious divine being, cooperating with the law. Thus the disciple is prepared and ready to follow the divine plan. Beforehand, he or she could not break through the limitations of the causal body because they were not sufficiently developed to be able to emerge safely from its protection. They had not evolved enough to face either the past or the future, nor strong enough to admit their errors or to undertake their redemption. The simile is very clear. If you realize the chick cannot leave the egg until a certain measure of strength has been developed, and is prepared to meet the dangers of earthly life and scratch for its own living, man cannot be released from his causal egg until he has unfolded within himself the power to stand alone and to meet the demands of life in the higher realms of consciousness. 
There are countless incremental steps along the spiritual path toward liberation, but only a handful of major initiations which will free the soul from the human kingdom. And when the time comes, at a certain initiation, their causal body is fully shattered by the downpouring energy coming from the monad, or the divine self. The shattering is also aided by the diamond rod of the Kumara, the great magnetized Syrian jewel which was brought to this planet to hasten the spiritual development of mankind and to liberate him from the encasement as soon as the spirit was ready, even though the matter of the causal body would not reach its normal time of disintegration for many eons. Thus, as occasionally a chicken must be helped to break its shell, so too man is helped to shatter his causal egg. When a man or a woman has reached a certain point of development, he or she is brought into an occult group within the inner planes to permit them to view themselves through the impartial eyes of those around them. But until, as stated before, a great interior strength has been developed, they will not be able to bear what must be shown to them. The causal body is formed to establish self-consciousness within the growing personality and protect it in its earlier cycles of incarnation. It is the center of I consciousness and can only be broken when a man is ready to release the personal I consciousness and enter universal consciousness, which is impersonal and free from all individuality as we know it. The one thing I ask of the Lord, that which I seek most, is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating in his temple. The Lord is my light and my salvation, so why should I be afraid? Though a mighty army surrounds me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, I will remain confident. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle, he shall set me high upon a rock. Then I will hold my head high. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait patiently for the Lord. Be brave and courageous, and he shall strengthen your heart. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. The long evolutionary process personified on the battlefield of Kurik Shetra is the immediate point in evolution when the higher and lower selves battle for control, gradually building up power in the vehicles. Realize before one is ready to tread the occult path, the powers of each vehicle must have been developed to a high point. A man must be capable of intense feeling, swift and perfected action, and of clear and concentrated thinking. You may wonder why the emotions are spoken of first, but these are the center of the motivating power for the development of both action and mind. Furthermore, it is the first vehicle which is heightened in the personality. Only as the emotions stir will one be driven to thought 
end to action. It is also the only complete vehicle of the personality and is the one through which the disciple makes the link or connection with the plane of intuition or booty and thus ultimately rises out of personal consciousness. Everything has its purpose. Try to grasp the long view of the evolutionary process and you will see that passion and rage, hatred and revenge are all forges upon which the sword of the individual is tempered. The pain and anguish of personal sorrow, the cruelty and suffering inflicted on humanity by circumstances or by individuals are all methods of increasing the intensity and tensile strength of one's nature. Pain develops endurance and willpower. Moral suffering purifies our character, whereas psychological anguish quickens the atoms of the mental body. When you shrink from the pain of the world, Consider that mankind is but the ore in the crucible, which shall be shaped ultimately into a golden chalice to contain the wine of the spirit. For matter has no function or purpose without spirit. Hence the two poles are never separated completely. And in contrast, spirit also requires matter to become fully actualized on all planes. Listen ever to the call of the spirit, to the secret voice of the soul, which bid you remember your divine destiny and which whispers in celestial tones of the splendor and beauty of the inner realms which belong to you. The qualities essential to the disciple are virtues of power dedication, purity, devotion, and good behavior are all preparatory, as one might say, a safeguarding of the power, so that it may not be diverted into wrong channels, but useless if they stand alone. The good man must become a great man, hence knowledge must become wisdom, and a powerful one at that if he is to be of value to the spiritual hierarchy. Self-sacrifice, aspiration, and unselfishness are virtues only insofar as they break the grip of the elemental forces in the three lower vehicles. For no man can be trusted with the powers of the soul while any of the desires of the personality could arise to dominate him. But with the breaking of the grip of self-centeredness, which has been necessary to develop a strong personality, must come the downpouring of spiritual will. But man can only emerge from his human chrysalis into some semblance of his divine self as will and power direct the vehicles of the personality. He must unfold the adult virtues which lead not only to self-mastery, but to mastery over circumstances, of elemental forces, and of human nature, if he is to attain his divine stature. The disciple must be strong, unswerving in his purpose, undeterred by circumstances or by personal ties from the path which he must tread. Keep this picture always clear in the mind's eye. A spiritual giant striding through the incarnations of earth to a majestic goal. For divine man is truly a titan. And only as the small personality takes on the vestures of its divine self can man begin to display the divine qualities of courage, of will, and of unfaltering fortitude which are but attributes of his true stature in the spiritual world.
judge all events and all actions on the physical plane from the point of view of the ageless titan. For while a human may not initially aggregate to themselves the qualities of the divine, he or she must never forget that they are the only instrument of that divine self in the three lower worlds, and when invested by the divine will, is the direct instrument of God. The ways of approach to truth are manyfold. Only truth is of importance. The disciple must learn to meet a man on whatsoever path is suited to him. The way is one, the paths leading to it are myriad. True understanding begets tolerance, and simplicity of heart shears away the points of dogma, which are creations of the ego, leaving the true way open. Understanding begets confidence, and confidence, friendship. Go as far as you can with man upon his own path, nor seek to lead him to yours. The sole importance is that man seek the light through whatever pan in the window it may be rayed. By my mother, I am brother, to the earth and all that grows, to the flowers and to the showers, I and to the eternal snows. By my father, let me rather claim my heritage above. Kin to fire, I may aspire to the creative realms of love. Strength and power are the dower given to the child of earth. Love supernal, love eternal, mark for man his holy birth. Once the disciple has done the necessary work and proved that he can employ the powers of the spirit unencumbered by the personality, he is ready to walk the burning ground, which leads to the portal of initiation. Initiation is the process whereby we undergo an immense expansion of consciousness. It is a major stepping stone along the spiritual path which leads the soul from mortal life into the immortal spirit. Beforehand, the disciple must undergo many tests, which are related to the physical, emotional, and mental planes. In short, the physical plane requires discipline, endurance, and composure, while the emotional plane requires restraint over the desire nature and self-control in every department of life certain tests gauge the reactions to one's temper. The tests of the mental plane are connected with concentration, the shaping of thought forms, holding the mind steadily in the light, while emptying the mind of all undesirable thoughts and making it impervious to stray vibrations, which are always beating upon its periphery. One must learn to also recognize the shadows cast by the vices of the personality. This cannot be seen until the mind has achieved tranquility, and when one watches with spiritual eyes for the first glimpse of revelation. The spiritual path is just as much striving for the light as it is looking into our own darkness. 
the final conquest of the mind lies in the destruction of the ego. Once this is destroyed, man emerges from the causal egg and begins his life as a spiritual being among his peers. One should consider the whole period before that point is achieved as embryonic or instinctual life, not the life of the spirit. This does not all come at once, but gradually over many incarnations, until picking up momentum like a spiral, and then finally culminating in a particular life. Before one breaks out, one is at the mercy of the elemental forces of the world. As a child before birth is at the mercy of their own mother's actions, protected only by their own sack. When this is ruptured, the child passes out into the world of living being from unconscious existence. This passing is always accompanied by pain and effort. So too is the second passing into the spiritual life. The purpose of initiation is to help destroy the causal body. Once the causal body is broken, the center of consciousness will be in the higher mind, which will then govern the lower vehicles while receiving direct guidance from the Divine Self or Monad. The development between the first, second, third, and fourth initiations corresponds to the period between birth and the 21st year. The first initiation is birth, or the beginning of the spiritual life. The second initiation corresponds to the seventh year, the taking control of the ego. The third to the 14th year, adolescence and the maturing of the powers within the vehicles. While the 21st year brings maturity, which corresponds to initiation of the adept or perfected man. As a man enters the world at 21, having attained his maturity, so too the adept graduates from the school of human experience on this planet, having taken the fourth initiation and finally shattering his causal body. Though it is not until the fifth initiation that one is truly considered a master of the wisdom. When one has gained the privilege of discipleship, there must be aspiration and dedication to labor in order to train and organize the vehicles to extract from them the highest potentiality. As the character develops and self-centeredness decreases, the nature matures in the warm and stimulating rays of the higher self, until initiation comes as a natural sequence of the unfolding spiritual nature. The growth of impersonal life marks the growth of the soul. When one can step aside and view oneself with the dispassion of another, when one can receive criticism with interest and look to improve their own technique, one is ready to move up the path of ascent. The impersonal life marks the conquest of the lower vehicles and the readiness to enter the impersonal life of the spirit. See it in life and watch for it in yourself. For the spirit is perfection, 
as it manifests in the vehicles, they attain more and more skill in action. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. Intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes beheld my unformed substance. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, dear God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. And when I awaken each morning, you are still with me. It is important for people of the earth to know that after death, life continues actively on all planes. When one dies, one does not pass into a world of shadows and ghosts who drift aimlessly in a languid fashion. Souls who mostly sleep through life will often linger for some time, but it is by no means a permanent state. On the contrary, release from the heavy burden of a physical body permits great increase in the rate of vibrations and the consequent increased activity with finer and more responsive matter. For those who are unprepared and who have not studied the conditions after death, the adjustment often takes time because the finer matter is easily shaped by thought and feeling so that a true picture of conditions is warped by preconceived ideas and prejudices. Time inevitably changes this, especially as instruction is given in classes, much like for immigrants coming to a new country. The three planes of the lower worlds are closely connected, and there are active groups on each, active especially on one or another. Active physical life is concerned with politics, art, music, and education, etc. Active emotional or astral life is concerned with similar things native to that plane, except the need for food and clothing has passed giving the inhabitants of that plane immensely more time. There is usually a definite life cycle or period of service on this plane followed by transition to the next, 
in a manner somewhat similar to death on the physical, but far less uncomfortable. The active period on the mental plane is followed by the rest period in paradise, or devachan, preparatory to the return to earth. Please understand that paradise is a location, a park, as it were, set aside for this period of refreshment where all worldly consciousness for a time is quiescent and the spirit broods over the dreaming soul and strengthens it for its return to labor. During the hours of sleep, the consciousness thread of the Antakarana is temporarily withdrawn from the brain. But at death, the life thread is severed from the heart, which renders the soul incapable of returning to that physical body. Hence, from one perspective, sleeping is but only a rehearsal for death, as both take us to the same location. The only real difference is just the duration of time between the two periods. There is the normal and the abnormal way of passing out of the body. One is natural, through the failing of the bodily functions, and the other is by violence as in war or some sort of accident. Both are karmically governed. When disease or failing organs are the cause, the transition follows an appointed course. There is the opportunity for ceremony as recognized by many religions, including that of Egypt, India, and the Catholic Church, which greatly facilitate the passing and prepare the soul for the next life. The letting go of the bodily forces helps the soul detach from physical life and decreases the consciousness centers more and more and eventually shifts the focus into the inner planes. One by one, the filaments of desire, of responsibility, of work, or of family ties are loosened, and the soul ceases to look for interest on the physical plane. It is like a boat preparing to leave the shore and heading for deep waters of the ocean. There are gifts and visitors to bid one Godspeed and farewell before sailing. And when the boat heads forward on its long journey, for a time, man is translated into another realm of existence. His attention is turned forward to his journey, not backward to those he has left behind. And when he reaches the other shore and has gone on ahead, his friends gather to welcome him to make his way easy in this new land. Though it is not really new, only forgotten, as we have crossed this gulf many, many times before.
After death, and the transition onto the next plane, there are ceremonies held which permit one to find themselves more easily and to adjust themselves to the changed conditions. In the inner planes, the atmosphere here is more easily molded into a semblance of earthly conditions by strong thought and feeling. With the aid of certain angels, a golden web is woven around the astral body, which cuts off the impacts of the physical plane and releases them from the past. Sooner or later, he or she faces the tribunal of their own spirit, and the life is weighed and judgment is meted out for the progress made. This does not come all at once. We are taken into one of the many chapels of light to be cleansed and purified of all gross matter that may still be clinging. Here we are bathed in a peculiar kind of vibrant light, not unlike a gentle form of electricity or electrical foam. They cleanse the recently deceased from earthly magnetism and then are left to a period of meditation and prayer. He or she is then required to raise their consciousness to the highest level possible, and this determines the level at which they will work. For there are many levels and rates of vibration upon the inner planes, and these are quite distinct from one another. Towns and cities are separated on earth by distance or space, in the astral world by vibration. And so many who inhabit the lower subplanes are quite unconscious that the others even exist. This is the orderly process. But when souls are flung out of the body abruptly, conditions are different. They often wander about for a period, lost and bewildered. Rescue workers must be sent out among them and instruct them on how to reorient themselves and how to lead them out of the lower levels in which they find themselves but do not normally resonate and often those thrown out of their bodies violently are not conscious of the change of environment. They cross over with all their faculties and ideas centered on earth life. There has been no gradual loosening of the sheath, no time to reorient the consciousness for the change ahead, nor time to prepare a suitable reception for the traveler. They are hurled with all their feelings involved in daily living into another sphere, and for a time they wander lost in a world of shadows and dreams. These souls must be gathered into bands and led by the hand into less confusing realms where they can be calmed, instructed, and prepared for usefulness in this forgotten world. This realm is personified as limbo, or the purgatory state, in the Christian dispensation, as it is in between the higher and lower states. The higher subplanes are quite heavenly, whereas the lower subplanes are truly hellish.
My spirit is a winged bird within a mortal cage. It struggles for deliverance through each succeeding age. My spirit beats against the bars, its shining plumage bruised. But I cannot find the secret law that holds it here confused. The wandering winds are blowing high on desert plain and field. Their haunting perfumes stir the past in memory concealed. What seeks my restless spirit here? What worlds must be regained ere peace enfold me in her wings in age-long search attained? Where go we and what seek then within these worlds of life? What ultimate glad ecstasy shall crown these years of strife? The spirit surges in my heart, its pinions beat in vain. I cannot find the answer yet to life's sad, strange refrain. When someone is about to die, there is a curious flickering of light above the head due to the weakening of the current of vitality. And by this, sign their friends on the other side are alerted and prepared to receive them. If someone has strong convictions of no future life, they are often the victim of self-hypnosis and continue unconscious for a long period very strongly visualized ideas of the afterlife sometimes create the conditions imagined, which lasts for a considerable period, but which delay the progress on the other side by forming a self-imposed prison. As groups gather into clubs and organizations and even into communities, so it is done on the inner planes. Friends and comrades gather together and undertake some project or service. Since one moves from place to place at the speed of thought, contacts are made in one's own level of vibration with friends or acquaintances by mere desire or intention. But one is limited to the level of the highest vibration one is capable of attaining. There are, in all worlds, social differences. In the world of illusion, the physical plane, these are determined by birth, rank, wealth, and occasionally by superiority or intelligence. But beyond the portals of death, the distinctions are determined by vibration. If a man learns the secrets of vibration, and how to attune himself to the kingdom of heaven, a whole universe opens up before him and the secrets of life and death, of heaven and hell, and the ultimate redemption of the race are flashed before his awakened consciousness. Until then, the periods between incarnations differ greatly with different souls depending upon how much they can develop without the experience of human action, or to put it otherwise, how necessary is the impact of physical plane life. And those who have not penetrated the mysteries of life can scarcely do so in death. It is a different sphere of existence, but the shedding of the physical body does not bring sudden illumination upon the mysteries of existence. 
Therefore, a major line of work on the inner planes is teaching those particular methods for increasing or rarefying vibration in order to be able to reach higher or more spiritual levels. The astral plane is like a vast school with many classes, many teachers, many colleges, which are not necessarily in touch with one another and whose methods and whose purposes differ. The prophets and seers of the world reach high into the abstract realms of thought and into the causes behind effects. And when they pass over, they may find it easier to enter into these exalted realms. However, the average man knows very little more after death than before. He has to learn a new technique, which takes time, and he has to attend school and prepare himself for the work in this new world, as a child has to prepare themselves when they take a new body. And as a child has to learn skills in directing a pencil, so too, after death, a man must learn the necessary skills in handling astral matter. And some people are very lazy. It is no easy task to make contact with the physical plane. And it is even more difficult to learn how to materialize wholly or in part, so as to appear to mortals. This is known to the masters on a higher level, but is usually learned by those more earthbound souls who refuse to move on, often due to some unreconciled trauma. These are the ghostly spirits who haunt certain locations or hover over gravestones for extended periods of time. They refuse to let go of the memory of their physical incarnation and redirect their attention upwards. So efforts should be made in order to help free these earthbound souls from their self-imposed prisons. There are, of course, certain periods when conditions lend themselves to contacts between the planes. And there are also certain places where the veil is thin. These all influence the methods of contact between worlds. Karma is fate, and dharma is duty. Karma refers to the law of retribution and reward, dharma to the type of work and conditions required by the soul. Karma maps out the field of work, the country to be traversed, as it were, in one life, with its limitations and its advantages, its pains and its joys. Dharma represents stations of life in which one is placed and the consequent type of work or duty required. Karma is determined by the past, Dharma by the needs of development by the soul in the present life. Only by fulfilling the conditions of one's Dharma can one make the next step forward in their evolution. Dharma deals with character development. Hence the expression in the Bhagavad Gita, better a man's own dharma, however unworthy, than the dharma of another, however exalted. In the working out of dharma, man is often called upon to do that which is most difficult for him, since those skills he has won in the past need no further development. 
but those skills in which he is lacking must be gained. It is only by learning the lesson required for any individual life that true progress can be made. The understanding of this law should prevent envy or jealousy, since we are drawn to the position in life where we can be of the most service to the plan. In carrying out one's dharma, you can create either good or bad karma, which will be adjusted in the next life. However, there are many different types of karma. Besides individual karma, there is also family or group karma, racial karma, as well as national and global karma. The national karma and the family karma are inevitable limitations which one must accept in addition to their own personal karma. In choosing a body, the soul takes that which most nearly fulfills the requirements for the development needed in that life. Frequently bodies are taken that greatly limit the manifestation of the soul and frequently hinder much of the soul's plan. In fact, there is such a lack of suitable bodies and environments that many advanced souls are unable to take birth or, if they do, are unable to overcome the handicaps of heredity in the three vehicles. This is a reflection of the evolution of humanity as a whole. Yet to do the job required, the soul must enter a family in a certain position that opportunity to serve in a peculiar way may be possible. Often people are involved in racial or national karma which they cannot avoid. It is not their karma but the karma of the group, family, or race to which they belong. It may hasten their evolution through the lessons learned, but it does not descend on them because of past personal sins. During the early periods of evolution, not much attention is paid to the type and place of incarnation. At that point, experience is needed, almost any kind of experience. Until someone has reached a certain point in evolution, it is not worthwhile to divert them into special situations suitable to their personal needs. However, when a man begins to raise his head above the mass of humanity, then the soul begins to take charge of directing its incarnations. Therefore, it is well to understand that karmic debts are not paid in full all at once it would be too heavy of a burden for the primitive soul to meet. Some are withheld for future adjustment in another life, just as some of the global karma is held back by those certain volunteers and the masters of the White Lodge, as it would be too heavy of a burden for all of humanity to endure all at once. Thus they sacrifice themselves for mankind, a continued sacrifice through many lives which requires labor and unparalleled fatigue. We must treat them reverently, for the conditions of the world would be entirely different otherwise, if it were not for their love and their intercession for poor orphaned humanity. In the confusion and uncertainty of the world today, the time has come when we should recognize the true purpose of life and turn our faces to the path which alone can lead us out of the quicksands of worldly life. Only as the leaders of the world attain the vision of the Spirit 
and offer the chalice of the heart to the downpouring of divine wisdom can a way be found out of the difficulties which beset us. So shall the day of peace and the day of brotherhood be achieved. May peace prevail in the chalice of the heart. There's a long, long tale spun of fire and dew and a long, long path where walk but the few. It leads to the cave of mysterious light through the walls of the grave to celestial delight where the sickle hangs low in the darkening sky and the evening star's glow grows clearer on high. There the twilight gleams rose and the evening wind sighs as it tenderly blows where the blessed one lies. The lovely one seen with the soul's inner eye, pure, shining, serene, like a star from on high. Come to lead us the way which all holy ones trod, that high, lonely way which leads us to God.